We're delighted to welcome you to this session of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Detol, Banega Swast, India. It's our pleasure to present now Rationality, what it is, why it seems scarce, why it matters. Steven Pinker in conversation with Mihir S. Sharma. Cognitive psychologist, psycholinguist, author, and public intellectual, Stephen Pinker's latest book, Rationality, What Is It? Why It Seems Scarce, Why It Matters, explores the essential life skills required to help overcome obstacles and enable rational thinking. Grounded in its quest for social justice and moral progress, the book studies how humanity at the peak of scientific understanding is still entrapped by the sensationalism of fake news and conspiracy theories, thereby undervaluing the rational brain. In conversation with writer and economist Mihir S. Sharma, Pinker discusses the inspiration behind his work and his quest for logic and reason. Steven Pinker, Johnston Professor of Psychology at Harvard, is an experimental psychologist who researches visual cognition, psycholinguistics, and social relations. An elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist, humanist of the year, recipient of nine honorary doctorates and several other accolades. Pinker was chair of the usage panel of the American Heritage Dictionary. Some of his critically acclaimed books include The Language Instinct, How the Mind Works, The Blank Slate, The Better Angels of Our Nature, The Sense of Style, Enlightenment, Now, and rationality, what it is, why it seems scarce, why it matters. Mihir Sharma is Director and Senior Fellow at the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi. In 2019, he co-edited What the Economy Needs Now with Abhijit Banerjee, Kita Gopinath and Raghuram Rajan. He's also a columnist for Bloomberg in New York and an Aspen Fellow. Please feel free to send in your comments by typing them in the comment section. Do follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions. And please do tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2022 and tag at Jaipur Lit Fest. Ladies and gentlemen, rationality, what it is, why it seems scarce, why it matters. Steven Pinker in conversation with Mihir S. Sharma. Hello, and welcome to this uh, uh, session at the Jaipur Literature Festival. Uh, 2022. And um, I'm delighted to be here in conversation with Professor Steven Pinker. Um, Steve is, well, I mean, he's a cognitive psychologist, I suppose, but he is now one of our uh, premier public intellectuals, I think, it's fair to say. Um, and particularly over the past 10 years, he has increasingly begun to engage in larger questions of uh, where, um, how the human mind and um, the benefits uh, of the enlightenment continue to affect us in our day-to-day -day life and how to, and in the organization of our societies in the 21st century, how to protect those gains, what it means, how what the ways in which we think continue to affect uh, the ways our societies are structured in our own lives and how we can constantly perhaps improve them. Um, and uh, Steve, in a while, I'm going to just ask you the standard question, perhaps, of why you wrote this book. Uh, but before that, I'd like to point out it's been maybe 10 years now uh, since you wrote The Better Angels of Our Nature, which of course is about, um, uh, I mean, I know you don't necessarily like the word progress, but it is about, in many ways, the progress that we have made. And since then, you've written a defense of the Enlightenment or an explanation of, of, of how the Enlightenment continues to matter. And and now you've written a book about, about rationality, which is, I think, perhaps the most... Uh, um, you're taking some of the principles that, and some of the achievements that you've talked about in previous books and you, and you try to link it up to what we know about the human brain. Now, to me as an outsider, obviously not familiar with what you actually are thinking about this, it seemed like you went from the large back to the small. You went from uh, the grand sweep of history to... Uh, uh, you know, how a particular point in history and the insights that that point, uh, that period uh, revealed um, continue to matter to maybe why our minds work in a way 
that means those insights need to be defended in some sense. You know, it, it, it's almost like this book, Rationality, is a justification of what you wrote earlier. Now, tell me, how, how off base am I? What, was there a sense of frustration in how your earlier books were received that caused you to say, okay, no, wait, why are people being irrational about this? Well, rationality is in many ways a return to my home turf because I am trained as a cognitive psychologist. So my specialty is how the mind works and uh, by extension, what is human nature? Not just how we think, but what are our motives and our emotions? And I, uh, this is just really kind of part of an arc or really a, a zooming in and a zooming out that I've done throughout my career, beginning with uh, <clears throat> the human mind, in particular language, which is my main, main specialty. But uh, <clears throat> after I wrote a book called The Language Instinct, arguing that language is a human instinct, that it's part of, of uh, human nature, it's universal, uh, it raised the question, what are the other human instincts? And so I wrote a book called How the Mind Works on how we see, how we remember, how we think, why we fall in love, uh, why we commit aggression, why we feel disgust, how we experience beauty, really an overview of what, what makes us tick. How does the human mind work? That in turn raised the question of um, if, <clears throat> if there is such a thing as human nature, if uh, we are, the mind comes into the world with some innate structure, organization given to it by evolution and wired into, into place, um, under the control of the genome. Uh, traditionally, that has political implications because different theories of uh, political reform and change really uh, hinge on different theories of human nature. Uh, and there is, a, for example, if you can't change human nature, does that mean that it's impossible to reform society uh, that will never have a utopia uh, because humans are inherently uh, flawed by their very design. So I explored some of the political and moral and emotional questions surrounding human nature in my book, The Blank Slate, The Modern Denial of Human Nature. The blank slate referring to the idea that there is no such thing as human nature, we're just blank slates that parents and society and culture uh, write on. And uh, the a belief in human nature, as I mentioned, often draws the accusation that it must be reactionary, it must be opposed to progress because uh, you can't change human nature. So I wrote The Better Angels of Our Nature in part to um, refute that idea, to point out that human nature is complex, it's got many parts. We have, I do think that we do have some rather nasty, primitive, ugly impulses like revenge and dominance. I think we have uh, inherent flaws in our ability to reason. On the other hand, the, uh, human nature also includes a capacity for empathy, for feeling other people's pain and wanting to reduce it, for self-control, we don't act on all our impulses, and for cognitive problem solving. We can figure, try to figure out how the world works and um, implement measures that make things better. There's nothing in that that's incompatible with human nature. Moreover, it isn't just that that is theoretically possible, I then point to, pointed to a number of historical data sets that show that, uh, in, as a matter of fact, rates of violence have gone down over the course of history. I myself was surprised when I first saw some of these graphs. They come from very different academic fields, from history, from sociology, from psychology, from criminology. Uh, I knew about them because people had, various people had sent them to me over the years, but no one had ever put them together. And so that's what I wanted to do in this book. The, uh, the book being the better angels of our nature. That led to the question, if there's been progress in reducing violence, has there been progress in other dimensions of human well-being? And I wrote Enlightenment Now because then I came across data sets, which again surprised me that uh, extreme poverty has declined over the, uh, the, the decades, probably less of a surprise in India where people have seen it in, with their own eyes than, than in uh, Europe and the United States where people are often unaware of it. Um, but that also illiteracy had gone down and child mortality had gone down and uh, working hours have gone down. Um, uh, um, 
traffic accidents have gone down, occupational deaths have gone down. In area after area, there really is progress that no one was aware of simply because they didn't look at graphs, they looked at the newspapers. And newspapers report uh, everything that goes wrong and things that go right aren't news. And so people are unaware of them. But that, so that was the intellectual uh, autobiography that led from a cognitive psychologist myself to go to larger questions about human history and enlightenment and, and progress. So now that I've, I, my most recent book, Rationality, is uh, really more, it's a concentration on um, my original domain of uh, interest and expertise, namely, namely the human mind. But I do tie it back to um, progress because the third part of the subtitle of the book, Why It Matters, one of the reasons that rationality matters is that it is human rationality that is responsible for most of our progress. Progress doesn't just happen. There's no magical force in the universe that makes life better. Quite the contrary, the laws of nature tend to make life worse. To the extent that we have reduced famine, reduced disease, or reduced war, it's because of rationality. Uh, if it is deployed toward the goal of increasing human well-being. Thanks. And, um, you know, I, I think that's a fairly cogent explanation of where we got, of how you got here. Um, but the fun part maybe about actually beginning to read your book is that to start off with, I think a lot of people would have assumed it would be a bit polemical about how we need to be more rational. I think that that's, you know, maybe the assumption that uh, um, many readers would make. But in many cases, and particularly at the beginning of the book, you, you, you take a, quite a bit of time over explaining not, not, a, not a defense of irrationality, but an explanation of why what appears to be irrational may not be completely irrational. And I thought that was an interesting set of choices to make. Indeed. And um, much of the book discusses the famous research from my own field of cognitive psychology on all the ways that humans are uh, irrational and biased and commit fallacies. You know, the gambler's fallacy that if there is a, say, a run of um, black on the roulette wheel, the gambler supposedly thinks that it's time for it to come up as a red and will then bet on red. That's a fallacy because the roulette wheel has no memory and so each spin is independent. Uh, it's an exam, or uh, if I give you a description of a hypothetical person who is um, active in Black Lives Matter protests, majored in philosophy, very smart, what is the chance that this woman, let's call her Amanda, is a, uh, uh, is a nurse, and what is, the, what is the chance that she is a feminist nurse? And people will say it's more likely that she's a feminist nurse than a nurse, even though by the laws of probability, the probability of A and B always must be less than the probability of A alone. So, you know, there have to be more nurses than there are feminist nurses, but people think it's more likely that she's a feminist nurse. So those are just two classic examples of fallacies. Cognitive psychology students learn about them, the, the uh, gambler's fallacy, the conjunction fallacy. But I, I did want to, and uh, famously, Daniel Kahneman, winner of the Nobel Prize, had a bestseller the, called Thinking Fast and Slow. I, I assume he's spoken at uh, Jaipur Literary Festival. Uh, he's, he's one of the most important books on human thinking of the last uh, uh, several decades. Uh, and, I, and it is brilliant work, and I depend on it a lot. But I also want to put it into perspective, because I didn't, don't like the idea that humans are just a bag of of, of stupidities and, and, and errors that our humans obviously have been smart enough to go to the moon, to extinguish smallpox, to develop vaccines in less than, uh, for COVID in less than a year, to develop in smartphones. And we've developed the benchmarks for rationality, logic and probability and game theory that allow us to say that humans are often irrational in the first place. But you know, who decided, who decided what was rational? Well, it's humans, it wasn't space aliens. So I wanted to present the fallacies of human reason in the context of why, why we think that way. Uh, why, why did human cognition evolve with these uh, fallacies? And many of them, uh, like the ones I mentioned, uh, probably are not fallacies in the context of natural, ordinary, 
uh, real life face-to-face -face human reasoning. Uh, what I call ecological rationality, that is rationality in the context of living your life. We have developed over the last few hundred years very powerful abstract tools like mathematical probability, um, uh, formal logic that can be applied not just to everyday life, but anywhere. They're uh, extremely powerful tools, but they're very abstract. And our minds did not evolve to think that way. We have to learn them in school or, or from books like Rationality. Many of the fallacies come from situations that are out at the edge of our ordinary experience that are unrepresentative of the way the world usually works that can be solved with the tools of formal tools of rationality, but the human mind doesn't think with the formal tools of rationality. Uh, it thinks of ecological rationality, the formal tools have to be learned. So that's part of the answer to your question of what I tried to accomplish and, and, and how. Uh, then there's the other question of the, what seems like utter madness, like belief in COVID conspiracy theories, like their you know, microchips that Bill Gates wants to implant in us to track us, or that um, there are uh, uh, ghosts and spirits and energy and in, in pyramids and crystals, uh, the, the paranormal woo-woo beliefs. That's another kind of irrationality that I was pretty much forced to try to explain because there's so much interest in it. Thanks, and, and we're, gonna, we're going to get to that as well because some of what you said there was actually quite surprising uh, uh, to me, but you know, I, and, and I think um, I, I loved the distinction that you drew between ecological rationality, which is, uh, came across to me uh, again as, as a non-expert reader, many ways as a, as a shortcut to deal with useful questions. And, you know, in, this, in, in, in social interactions and in your interaction with the natural world, the human mind developed the, uh, uh, um, certain ways of seeing certain obvious questions, which as you point out, aren't strictly formally true, but generally were true. And you, you draw, for example, a difference between propensity and probability, which I thought was uh, uh, well worth understanding. Um, and, and as you point out, then you say that this is something that we were learned in the modern world, uh, trying to develop this sort of, sort of sense of abstraction and drill it into ourselves as kids and uh, uh, then pick up this toolbox and then apply it in different areas. Um, you know, and, but you, you then make in some sense uh, a larger argument for why reason matters. I mean, you get uh, into the uh, uh, shortly after this, you get into questions of uh, uh, what rationality looks like, what the assumptions are, etc. But before you do that, you do talk about um, if you know you're right, and this is a good, this is a great passage in the book. If you know you're right, why should you try and persuade others through reason, right? And um, it's, I, I, I'd like you to sort of give that explanation again for us. It's like. I may know I'm right about something. Why shouldn't I just say, okay, I know I'm right. I, I have the ability to maybe force people to, to uh, behave uh, uh, the way that I want them to. Why should I instead try to persuade them using the tools of rationality? Well, it, it's a relevant question in, uh, in, in an era of increasing censorship, both uh, government censorship in countries like Russia and Hungary and um, uh, and, and in some ways, perhaps uh, India and the United States, but also in institutional censorship, in, in the canceling of controversial writers and, and speakers, where uh, the, the implicit rationale for silencing people is people should not be allowed to spread misinformation. They should not be allowed to say things that are incorrect and harmful. The problem is that the people who are doing the censoring or canceling have to assume that they are infallible, that uh, they are so sure of what they are, uh, that they are correct, that they can use brute force to shut people up, to remove them from their platforms, to prevent other people from hearing them. The problem being, of course, that we are all human and, uh, and hear the message from Daniel Kahneman and other cognitive psychologists is uh, relevant, namely, our reasoning always is subjected to flaws and biases. Particularly, we always, one of the, the, the biggest biases is the bias bias. Namely, we all insist that we're not biased, that everyone else is biased. Uh, now, given that everyone thinks that they're right, and if they disagree, they can't all be right, 
uh, then uh, the very act of repressing some uh, uh, speech uh, is, uh, is really indefensible because it presupposes that the person doing the censoring has a, a pipeline to the truth, is an oracle, has been divinely inspired. That's not the way our species finds the truth. Where our species, the only way that we find the truth is through open debate and valuation of ideas. Uh, in science, in journalism, in democracy, in the court system, people uh, express their arguments, other people uh, show what's wrong with them, and then the entire uh, community of arguers, debaters, has to sift through the arguments to determine which is best. Given human fallibility, that's the only way that we can approach the truth. Yeah, I, I thought it was actually quite interesting that um, at, at one point you say uh, human, well, I'm, again, I'm paraphrasing, but you say something along the lines that humans may not be natural logicians, but they are natural lawyers in that we are able to dissect other people's arguments, discover the flaws in them much more easily than we are to uh, construct formal defenses of our own beliefs and, and opinions. And therefore, you, you, you point out that that means that a small group of people sometimes, a committee, can come to a, a better understanding of, of a situation than an individual. And, you know, what was really interesting to me here was that we actually had Daniel Kahneman on, as you say, at, at Jaipur. And uh, Daniel's uh, last current book, Noise, which he's written with Cass and a couple of other people, um, makes a similar point. Um, while addressing a different issue, saying that you can reduce noise because the, the unfelt and un understood biases of individuals cancel each other out in small group settings. And, you know, so you both from different points of view arrive at this notion that a committee of individuals can sometimes come get to the truth in a way that uh, one individual may have trouble uh, discovering. Oh, in yes, there, ab absolutely. And, and um, you know, and Kahneman has been saying... <laughs> Um, uh, making points like this for, for many years. Uh, in his recent book, uh, Noise, he distinguishes noise from bias. And this is a common distinction in statistics, where bias means you're always wrong in a particular direction. Uh, noise means you're always wrong, sometimes underestimating something, sometimes overestimating, but just unreliable. Uh, and, and indeed, um, groups of people deliberating most obviously can reduce noise just because you average people's assessments as long as they're made independently. If you have people first sit around a table and express their views, that won't necessarily reduce noise because the most influential, the most charismatic, the most powerful, the first person to speak could influence everyone else. And then instead of it being you know, 10 opinions, it's one opinion after all. So for example, uh, Kahneman and Sunstein and uh, Siboni recommend uh, privately uh, or secretly expressing an estimate first. So you have say 10 independent estimates, that's likelier to average out the various sources of noise. But even when you have deliberation and uh, when it, after the stage in which the uh, assessments are announced, if there, then when there is debate disagreement, biases can be reduced as well. So even in simple logic problems that people where cognitive psychologists have shown people uh, get the wrong answer 90% of the time, often you put them in small groups and they get the wrong answer only 30% of the time. Because all it takes is one person to see the right answer and they can convince everyone else in the group. So people often are capable of having correct, of understanding the correct answer when it's pointed out to them, but uh, they may not arrive at the correct answer just by themselves. You know, I was trained as an economist, and one of the one of the fun parts of this book was sort of uh, going through the middle sections where you talk about various aspects of rationality, you know, trade offs, um, uh, you know, decision uh, uh, decision analysis, and so on and so forth. And recognize you you are approaching you know some of the things that we learn in Econ One Hundred and One um, in a slightly different uh, you know from a slightly different direction. Uh, and it's it's great fun, and congratulations on that book. I really uh, on on that sector, on those sections. I really enjoyed uh, uh, reading that different perspective of you know on utility curves and trade offs and so on and so forth. What 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 really intrigued me was that 
again, uh, to draw a parallel between uh, 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 this book and uh, um, the Kahneman, Sunstein, Siboni book, uh, you all, both of you, both the books end their methodological section, if I were, you know, if I were to call it that, with multivariate regressions. As uh, regressions being in the end, probably the best tool that we have to try and balance out various types of question um, and to get it on. And I, and I thought that was, uh, maybe I, I overreacted in doing that as a justification of all my life choices, but thank you. Uh, but anyway. So, uh, uh, regression being kind of the family of uh, statistical mm -hmm. techniques that pretty much in, uh, encompass I don't, I don't know what the percentage is, but it could be like 90% of what social scientists uh, do is a version of, uh, some version of regression. And it's the technique that you use. I mean, you, you, you're trained in economics and um, uh, when we have to try to determine, distinguish causation from correlation, that is, does drinking coffee give you a heart attack or is it just the people who drink coffee also smoke and it's the smoking that gives them the heart attack? Uh, or lack of exercise. And, and that's real world is filled with these confounds. Um, so how do you ever know? Well, ideally you do a randomized controlled trial. You give, have a large group of people, you have half of them drink coffee and half of them not drink coffee, follow them for 10 years, you see how many heart attacks there are in each group. Now, of course, that's not very practical for a lot of problems in the real world. And so we're kind of stuck with the data that are already out there, correlational data. Namely, we record how much coffee people drink, uh, how, much, how many heart attacks they have, and try to figure out if there's a correlation. Now, the correlation doesn't imply causation, but if we also have measures of how much they exercise, uh, how, how many cigarettes they smoke, how much red meat do they eat, uh, what was their family history, then regression is the technique where you throw all of that data into a, a hopper and you can try to pull out uh, whether there's any specific effect of, say, uh, coffee. Now, uh, it's not perfect. It, uh, the only really guaranteed way, and even there it's not totally guaranteed, but the gold standard for establishing causality is with an experimental manipulation, a randomized controlled trial. But since we're not God, we're not supreme dictators, we can't force people to drink coffee or not to drink coffee, uh, uh, then multiple regression is the next best thing. But I'll just make one other comment, which is I'm glad you brought up your training in economics, because there is a, a, a discipline of a subfield in economics called behavioral economics, which is really another word for the cognitive psychology of decision making under uncertainty. And there, the, the two fields really uh, overlap a lot. Yes, and you have a lovely section in your book explaining time preference and uh, hyperbolic discounting, which is essentially about how, um, you know, uh, to take the example that you use, you may, uh, you may know that if, if you're offered uh, um, a rich dessert for 15 minutes uh, away from now, you're likely to take it, right? Saying, because there you're making a trade-off between feeling too full later and maybe feeling fat tomorrow versus the immediate benefit of a dessert. Of a dessert. But if you're offered that dessert 100 days in the future, you're quite likely to say, ah, no, I think I'd rather take the feeling of, you know, happiness that I'll get on the 101st day if I don't eat the dessert on the 100th day. And on some level, that's irrational. But as you point out, it's, it's actually not, it, depending on your model of rationality. Yes, that's a great example uh, of a question that interests <clears throat> economists and psychologists, uh, where, where the, the, the uh, two fields intersect. For economics, for example, it, it, it uh, is related to uh, interest rates, where interest rate is basically rewarding someone for deferring consumption or gratification now. Why should I have money to spend in a year and not now? Well, you'll have, uh, I'd rather have it now. If you, if, if you insist that I give it up for a year, you're going to have to pay me you know, two percentage points or, or, or whatever it is. Uh, and qu your questions like when do consumers um, save or versus invest versus consume? How do can governments change that? And a question that puzzles economists and psychologists is why there is this, what, are, what is called hyperbolic discounting. 
it's a, a, a misleading term because people think of hyperbole as exaggeration. But yes, but it refers to a kind of curve that is, is kind of more L-shaped rather than uh, gradual. And, um, and it does, uh, you explained it very well, it refers to roughly speaking, being able to exert self-control in the distant future, but not in the immediate future. You I mean, it, 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 the, the classic example, of course, Steve, being, uh, and I think that a lot of people will have, uh, uh, you know, a lot of viewers will understand this immediately, um, that you can't pay with practically no gym in the world where you can pay per go. You know, every gym says, sign up for six months because they know that uh, you're likely to go in if it's pay per go, you're not going to go as often and they're not going to make as much money. But if at, at you know, six months yeah. in advance, you're going to tell yourself, yeah, yeah, definitely for the next six months, I'm going. And so you sign up. And so you're locking yourself into, you think you're locking yourself into a particular way of behaving. So there's, there's great, great example, stuff in yes. here. There's great stuff in here. And I, I just want to say that it was also terrifically entertaining to read it, which I think that people shouldn't think that this was in any way a dry book. It has fun examples. It has a lot of, uh, 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 there are quite, quite a few jokes in there. Um, uh, uh, in fact, a lot of pretty good ones. There are cartoons as well. Um, and, but, but we end up, as I think, as, you, as we so often do, with trying to then explain if rational, you know, if, if humanity is evolved to be rational in particular ways, um, or, um, and if we have, and if we've refined those tools through over the past few hundred years through the methods of abstraction that you have, uh, that you outline, why does the world appear so irrational to us? Why does it have these elements of irrationalities? And, um, and then you have a bunch of explanations there. And you, you know, for example, you talk about my side bias, you talk about which is, uh, and you want to explain on my side biases? That, that, because that, that's something that people, I think, will really immediately understand when you explain it. Yeah, so my, my side bias is exactly what it sounds like, namely the bias to make your side, your religion, your political party, your political ideology, your, your, your country, your group, um, seem wise and noble and correct, and the other side seem stupid and evil. And it's one of the most powerful cognitive biases. It's unlike many of the biases which are correlated with it, raw intelligence. This is uh, pretty much uncorrelated. If you're very, very smart, that often means you can come up with brilliant arguments for why you're right. But whether you're right or not, you're very good at, at arguing that you are. Uh, and it is behind a lot of the uh, disagreements and, um, and indeed censorship and uh, uh, indefensible beliefs that people have. Rationality is always in pursuit of a goal. And if the goal is not to be correct, but if the goal is to have your side win, then you can apply an awful lot of rationality toward a, uh, a, a belief or a position that's incorrect uh, because you're not striving for correctness, you're striving to win. I, I, again, it, it alludes to the, the, uh, uh, the phenomenon you mentioned that it's not so much that human beings are intuitive scientists, we're intuitive lawyers and intuitive politicians. We want, we want to win, win, win our case. That's why, of course, we have, I mean, the way to um, circumvent my side bias is to have institutions like science uh, with its open debate and empirical testing, democracy with its political parties that, uh, and, and, and separation of powers and checks and balances, um, uh, multiple opinions in newspapers and freedom of the press and freedom of speech. All of these are ways of making sure that one person's or one side's my side bias doesn't impose a bad belief on the entire society. Uh, but it is very powerful. There's a, a cognitive psychologist named Keith Stanovich who wrote a book called The Bias That Divides Us. Uh, a very, uh, and he is one of the world's experts on, on rationality in general. In fact, I would encourage the uh, Jaipur Literary Festival uh, organizers to invite Keith Stanovich. You know, and this section where, we, where you talk about my side bias and a couple of other explanations perhaps for some of the uh, irrationalities we continue to see in the world um, is part of a section where um, you essentially try to explain 
why rationality matters for society and for material progress. And then it's part of the section of three. One is this society and material progress. One is why rationality matters in our lives, for our health, for our finances. And the third is uh, rationality in, in history and in, in how it's crucial for moral progress to make a rational argument. And sometimes just pointing out an inconsistency can, in some cases, go viral. And there are lovely examples there. Um, do, do you want to talk a little bit about you know, that, that concluding section of the book, which is actually pretty powerful, about how you feel that rational argument has on occasion actually changed, you know, ideas and arguments have changed history themselves. Yeah, so this relates to the question that we opened with, which is why I've, uh, what's the connection between my new book, Rationality, and my previous books, Better Angels of Our Nature and Enlightenment Now. I was surprised in researching the history of violence and oppression, how often movements for social reform began with an argument where there would be some philosopher or theoretician or, or activist who laid out a, an argument why some practice of the day was inconsistent with values that people claimed to hold, why you could not justify religious persecution or war or absolute monarchy or the oppression of women or slavery or cruel sadistic punishment. And these um, philosophers or theoreticians would make their case. It would then, as we now say, go viral. It would be printed in pamphlets, translated into other languages, sometimes uh, snuck into a country when it was illegal, but avidly read and discussed in uh, coffee houses and salons and, and, and pubs, and uh, would eventually spread and become influential and, and uh, drive movements for change successfully. And I argued that not only has this often happened, at least that's been the historical sequence. Without a randomized controlled trial, you can't prove cause and effect, uh, but at least the putative cause occurred before the putative effect, namely the treatise, the manifesto, the argument would have come before the movement for social change. But I think just as important, it's not just that this has happened, but this really is how it should happen. Because just having a mob uh, it doesn't necessarily lead to social progress. It could also lead to riots and pogroms and genocide uh, and, and um, uh, establishment of uh, terrors and autocracy and dictatorships. It's only when a movement for social change can be justified that we call it moral progress. Yes, and I think that's, that's very true and something well keeping in mind. And you also conclude with a series of suggestions uh, you know, maybe, I hope they're not, you know, screaming into the into the void, but saying essentially, what are the ways in which we maybe can try and increase the, uh, uh, the role of rationality in public life? And one of them, I, as you say, a valorization of the norm of rational of rationality itself. Now, what do you mean by that? How how would you yeah. see that happen? Yeah, so in this way, I've been partly influenced by a, an eccentric group that's very prominent here in the Bay Area called the Rationality Community, which tries to uh, foster the idea that we shouldn't always try to win an argument. Uh, we should try to determine the truth, and they're not the same thing. So we should be open to contrary points of view. Instead of reducing your opponent to a straw man that you should, can you know, easily uh, flick out, down, you should try to make him a steel man. Uh, that is, state the argument against yourself in the strongest possible version and try to refute that. Uh, try to master some of the formal tools of rationality. Earlier, we distinguished between ecological or common sense or natural rationality and formal or mathematical rationality. We should try to make intuitive some of the formal tools of rationality, such as uh, Bayes rule, B-A-Y-E-S, uh, one of the ways of judging the uh, how much uh, credence, how much, what degree of belief we should assign to a hypothesis depending on the strength of the evidence. Anyway, all of the, this mindset of don't always try to win, try to determine what's right or, or wrong. That should be a kind of uh, a social norm. When the facts change, uh, change your mind. Many people think that it's a virtue to hold on to a belief no matter what. 
a sign of your strength, of your of your, your consistency, your fortitude. But when you think about it, that really should not be a virtue. That should actually be a flaw, that the, we should cultivate a mindset of active open-mindedness, namely being willing to change your mind depending on the evidence. Great, and, and um, I just want to say again, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. Um, and in fact, I will also say that it had uh, the the best hint to understanding Bayes' rule that I've ever come across, which is to think about it visually, uh, because otherwise it can be pretty difficult. Um, and um, I, again, thanks for writing something that was both entertaining and I think vitally important. Uh, Steve, uh, and any last thoughts? Um, no, I think we've covered a lot of ground and I thank you, Mahir, for your, uh, your interesting observations and questions. Thank you for having me on. Great, and, and, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Stephen Pinker and Mihira Sharma for redefining rationality and exploring its intended impact on humankind in this conversation with us. Thank you all for watching and being a great audience. Please do stay logged on and continue to watch with us all the great sessions that we have specially curated for you. And now for a GLF Writer Shorts for you. <laughs>